Good afternoon and good morning, everyone, wherever in the world you may be. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to speak for a few minutes about uh, NISO-STS uh, and XML in general and how it can benefit your workflow in a standards organization. Uh, and we'll cover the sort of past, present, and the future of NISO-STS. So I'll give you a little bit of a peek under the hood at what we have coming up. So remember when traveling around Europe, meant constantly changing currencies every time you crossed a border to another country. I remember doing this as a young backpacker and always trying to minimize what I had left over when I crossed any border, which sometimes meant starving the last 24 hours in a country. Um, standards are kind of like that too. If you don't have standards, if things don't work together, then it actually makes life a lot more difficult. And so the euro, it can be thought of as one form of standardization and interchange, because what it did is it lowered economic barriers, eased travel between countries around Europe. Uh, the, it increased the interoperability of economies through Europe and the economic opportunity for uh, companies in individual European countries. And so what STS is, is a standard for standards that ultimately will aid in production facilitate interchange between organizations, for example, a national standards body adopting an ISO standard, uh, and promote interoperability. And ultimately, uh, STS and XML can be used to create new publication opportunities for your organization. Also, remember when standards were on paper and that was it. They might have been in a three ring binder so that you could add in addenda pages when they were published. But fundamentally, they were published on paper and read on paper. Well, today we have transformative technologies. We have smartphones, we have uh, specialized reading devices, we have generalized tablet devices. And the, uh, the, the device market is constantly expanding, requiring not just support for new devices, but for a wider array of formats that are used by those devices. And all of that requires a new foundation in order to pr produce and publish your content. And ultimately the best way to approach that foundation is to think about things from the perspective of having an XML workflow. And it's that XML workflow that enables multi-platform publishing so that with a single source file, you can actually target PDF, eBooks, Kindle, HTML, and so on. Enter XML for standards. Starting in 2012, we started working with ISO for a project that would be the foundation for a new way for them to publish standards. And that new way was gonna be based on XML. It was not, <clears throat> excuse me, it was not ISO's first attempt to use XML, but this time we stepped back and we looked at a whole bunch of different factors. And ultimately for ISO, XML is the foundation for creating their PDF and for their online browsing platform and facilitates all kinds of other things such as metadata sharing and additional formats. So let's actually take a look at ISO as a case study because that's really the foundation of where STS comes from. Prior to 2012, what was being used in production was the ISO STD template, which was a Microsoft Word template and that was used both for authoring and for production. It required a huge amount of in-house cleanup. And then ultimately the Word file was converted to PDF. But this workflow had lots and lots of issues. First of all, the template itself was very large and complex. It had grown to be, the just the template file had grown to be over five megabytes of styles and macros and so on. Uh, there was varying quality of use. Some committees used it uh, 100%, some didn't use it at all. Some kind of tried to use it, but didn't do a very good job. And in addition to all of this, there were increasing security issues with uh, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Windows, even trying to install a template that had macros onto uh, systems of end users, of authors who were actually working on writing the standards. Then once the standard arrived in the editorial and production team, it took extensive time to format up the standard with 
this same macro so that you could then, then very easily create a PDF from it. But this had a couple of problems. The first is publication times were very slow because this took a huge amount of work. The other is Microsoft Word is not a page layout application. I like to say that Word is a very good authoring tool. It's an okay editing tool and it is a lousy typesetting tool. And so essentially what ISO was doing was using it, <coughs> excuse me, using Microsoft Word as a typesetting tool, something for which it's not well suited. And the ultimate product that reached the customers was not suitable for e-readers. It wasn't suitable for things like smartphones. Anyone who's ever tried to read a page-oriented PDF on a smartphone knows that that is not a fun task. And it had no rich hyperlinks. So there were no internal uh, uh, hot, uh, hyperlinks between different sections or different figures. And if one standard cited another standard, there were no external links that you could immediately jump to a PDF file that had that additional standard. So ultimately it wasn't a very, very good workflow, but it was an expedient workflow because it had one huge benefit. Because with standards, they always have to go back and be revised. And so what this meant is if the Word file was used to create that PDF, you could then hand the Word file back to the committee for the next round of revisions, knowing it had the exact same text as was in the PDF. So for that expedient reason, ISO had this word-based PDF workflow, but it made it very hard to integrate XML into that workflow. So what ISO's goals were in terms of going to an XML workflow, first to improve their publication process. They knew it was taking too long. They knew it was unwieldy. Second, to have outputs in multiple formats, uh, not just PDF, but HTML and EPUB. And third, to be able to easily create red lines between different versions of standards. And for a larger overview of this entire workflow, you can see this publication that I wrote uh, eight years ago about XML publication workflows for standards. And it is a much deeper case study of ISO and what they did. So when we started working with ISO back in 2011, one of the first questions we asked them is, what's your XML model going to be for your standards? And they said, well, we don't really have one yet. We've been thinking about TEI. And so we talked a bit further and realized that they might want to investigate a little bit further before locking in on a model. And we recommended that they talk with the team at Mulberry Technologies because they are among the world's top experts in DTD development. And what Mulberry did is they came back and said a couple of things. First, it makes far more sense to base what you need on an already public schema or uh, standard because that will make it much easier to adopt and there will be a lot of lessons learned in history already baked into that. And the second thing they said is for the kind of content you've got, there are probably four sort of document text schemas out there to consider. Ditta, DocBook, JATS, and TEI. And so Mulberry went off and they did a formal analysis of ISO's content. Uh, they already had quite a bit of experience with all four of these models and they came back and recommended that JATS be uh, used for the foundation of a uh, DTD for ISO's requirements. And ISO looked at that work and said, okay, this makes sense. But then what they said is we can't use JATS out of the box. Uh, we're going to have to modify it for standards. And I'll talk a little bit more about the history of JATS further on, but just for those of you who don't know it, JATS is designed for journal articles. It's been a standard since 2012, but an ongoing project since 2003. And so that's why it made sense. And as we'll see, what about it made sense as a foundation for STS? Well, it turned out that standards and journal articles share a lot of common structures. They have sections, they have tables, they have figures, they have equations, they have bibliographies. JATS was also a well-developed and well-tested model. It was already by 2011 in use by thousands of journals around the world. Uh, and it's also well-documented. It's easily modifiable for use with standards. There's actually documentation on how to modify JATS uh, for your own needs. And there was also strong third-party third support 
uh, both in terms of uh, tools as well as vendors. And while that should not necessarily be a sole reason for choosing a given XML model, it certainly helped in terms of ISO's thinking that, gee, if we go in this direction, we're not just forging completely new ground. There will already be third-party support for a very similar model. So what ISO had Mulberry do was take the then current version of JATS, which was version 0.4. It was actually what we consider a late beta version before the first 1.0 official standard. Uh, so this work was going on in 2011. JATS actually 1.0 became a standard in 2012, so just a year later, and made a few critical changes for standards. First, the top level element of JATS was called article, but that didn't make sense for standards. And so a new top level element was uh, added uh, or we replaced article with an element called standard. So that what your top level element in, in a, is in a standard is something called standard. And then within that, you have metadata, you have the body, you have any back matter. The second thing that was done is to throw out the metadata for journal articles because that didn't apply to standards and to create new metadata elements uh, that would work not only for ISO standards, so there was an ISO meta block, but for regional standards, for example, SEN or GCC in the Gulf states uh, for regional metadata, and then national metadata for individual national standards bodies so that you could have metadata in a single document that would cover the full adoption chain of, for example, an ISO standard that becomes a regional standard with SEN that then becomes a uh, BSI uh, standard in the UK. So it would cover something like a BSEN ISO adoption chain all within one XML file. The third thing that was added was the TBX, uh, a model based on TBX, an ISO standard for defining terms and definitions. This was needed because terms and definitions have a much richer type of markup requirement in standards than anything that we've ever seen in journal articles or books. And so this way, uh, the terms and definition section can have a uh, very, very rich markup. And the last is that standards tend to cite a lot of other standards and there, were, there was a need to create a better model for doing that. JATS did not have a very good model uh, for citing other standards uh, because they are not frequently cited in journal articles. And so elements were added to cite other standards. There were other elements added at a detail level, but these were really the four main changes that were made in converting uh, JATS to ISO STS. Another thing that ISO did, and this actually proved very important just as it had uh, in 2003 with JATS when that was first made available, ISO made the DTD publicly available. They posted it on a website. In fact, it's still available there, even though we now have NISO STS. And they put up the DTD, not only the DTD files, but also full documentation and other resources. And they made this available to other standards organizations. And in fact, ISO right from the beginning was thinking that this would be a great way to distribute their content to other national standards bodies so they could use it for adoptions. And in fact, that has happened. So this, as with JATS, turned out to be a critical step of taking the work, making it freely available. When ISO finally stepped back in 2014 or 2015 and looked at the value of what this project had been to the organization, they realized that first and most importantly, it had been a catalyst for positive change through the entire organization. Business rules were codified because they went to a much more electronic driven workflow, a software driven workflow, rather than individual editors doing what they thought was right. It refocused the editorial team on high value content editing, rather than just fighting with Microsoft Word to do formatting of standards. And because all of this was codified, it actually permitted ISO to do some production outsourcing so they had more overflow capacity. They didn't have that capacity in a, or that opportunity in a largely manual workflow. Ultimately, and uh, while this was hoped for, the level of this was much bigger than expected. It uh, allowed for much faster publication times. The average publication time from the time a standard uh, got from a committee into ISO 
prior to the XML workflow had been about six months. And now, uh, as of 2015, it was down to about a month. I actually have not checked uh, to see what the current uh, publication time is. And this also led to significant, co significant cost savings. The editorial team was no longer wasting time doing things that could be done automatically in the XML workflow around formatting. What this also led to were completely new opportunities in terms of products for ISO. They were able to build out what they call the online browsing platform or OBP. And with this platform, you can go, and this by the way is completely public, anyone can go without an account. You can go and search on a word like pasta. And you again get a list of all the standards that mention pasta. Now, sure, with a PDF workflow, you could simply index the metadata and then the PDFs for all of these standards, but it gets more interesting because if we click in on one of these standards, you now see over here on the left, a table of contents for the standard. And it may be a little hard to see, but you'll notice things like scope, normative references and terms and definitions are all in black because those are freely available. But once we get past terms and definitions, the rest of this is all in gray and it's not available for free. So what this means is by having the forward in the previous slide and now the very tail of the terms and definitions available, with the XML markup, it's very easy to create a sort of freemium model with the content and make more of it available for free without giving away the whole thing. And what I've circled in red is, gee, you need to, this section is not publicly available, which is everything from the terms and definitions down to the bibliography. In other words, the heart of the standard, unless you actually pay for the standard. So XML has provided ISO a way to make much more information available for an end user to do a much more informed uh, buy, uh, make a much more informed buy decision about that standard. Or if they simply need access to a uh, definition for a term, they don't actually have to go and purchase the whole standard for it. Furthermore, we have very rich hyperlinking. So these upper circles above the uh, uh, this part not freely available section, these are section cross-references to section 6.11 and 6.12 and Annex A. And these are clickable so that uh, if you have the full text available, if you've paid for the standard, you can actually click through the standard. And even in the PDF, they're clickable. So we're in section uh, 3.4 here, uh, optimum cooking time. And if you were to click on this link I'm hovering over, 6.11, that would take you directly to that section, even in the PDF that you can purchase. There are also external links. And what we have here are uh, mentions of other ISO standards. And this is actually particularly interesting because with the XML, we've got a standard in bibliography that was published in 2011. And then it can reference, um, I'm sorry, not 2011, 2008, but it can then reference newer standards. So if I click through, actually, let me go back for a second. If I click through on this standard, which is um, uh, a much earlier year, it will actually take me to the current version, which is 2009. And so what XML allows us to do is actually resolve to the newest version of a standard when that's published, if we choose, in a linking environment. Now that obviously wouldn't happen in the PDF, but in a more dynamic web-based environment, we can do that. The other thing is with search results, we can get much more deeply into the standard. And this is one of my favorite features of the online browsing platform is we can look at snippets so we can see exactly where the word pasta has appeared in all of these different cases. The other thing, and this was really important for ISO, is they wanted to be able to do on the fly conversions because anyone who's ever tried to build a redline version between a previous version of a standard and a current version knows that just simply is not fun. It's a very ugly task to do manually, but what ISO was able to do was partner with Typeify and a company called Delta XML so that what they could do is offer a redline button. And when you pop this down, you actually get all previous versions of the standard so that then you can choose any two arbitrary versions to compare, which is another cool feature because with traditional redlining, 
you only got a red line between the most current version and the immediately prior version. And when we select that, we now get an on the fly created red line showing you exactly what's new in the most recent version of the standard. So these are things that you can do with STS XML at, that have enabled ISO to have a much richer environment for their customers. So ISO was off to the races. They went into full production with ISO STS in 2012. And by 2015, they were cooking along nicely. ASME comes into the story around 2013. ASME, the American Society for Mechanical Engineers, has a huge standard called the Boiler Code. And I think it's something like 31 volumes, and they had spent the previous six years uh, working out an XML workflow for it. It was based on DocBook. But what they'd found that because uh, the Boiler Code was so, uh, so huge, that their XML environment had become highly customized and was fragile and not sustainable. So when they finally got the 2013 edition out, they said, let's step back and see if we can figure out a better way to do this. So they had an all day meeting and they decided let's move forward with something completely new based on DITA. And then the next day they happened to walk across the street to the annual Society for Scholarly Publishing Conference. And that was where they learned that ISO had, uh, which had created ISO STS, was actually considering making it a formal standard with NISO. So it would be a standard in parallel with JATS at NISO. And ASME literally within hours threw out the idea of DITA and said, you know what, this makes far, far more sense. And not only that, we want to be a part of it. And so as co-chair of the STS Standing Committee, I want to explicitly say, I'm extraordinarily grateful for ASTM and ASME uh, together not only submitting a work item proposal in May 2015 uh, to NISO to create the NISO STS project, but also for sponsoring that project. They have uh, given us the funding that we've needed to do this project correctly, mostly in terms of building out the DTD properly and making sure it's properly documented and then maintaining a website for it. And more recently, they've both been funding and IEEE has joined into that funding. And so I'd like to acknowledge and thank all three organizations for having provided the funding that's so important for this project. So let's step back for a second and think about, well, why create an ISO STS? ISO STS was already working successfully for ISO and a number of uh, national standards bodies, NSBs, who had rapidly adopted it. But this is where ASME came in. They looked at it and said, you know, it works super well for ISO and a lot of it's gonna work well for us, but there are certain things that just are not ready for us in particular around the metadata. And so what NISO STS provides in contrast to ISO STS is a stable standard that should work for most standards publishers. We won't guarantee it works for all, but we think it should work for most anyone out there. And it provides a tool it, it provides guidance to vendors of software tools that help in this space and also to conversion vendors. So the documentation has a lot about best practices. But even more importantly than that, it provides a common format for sharing both metadata and full text and a common XML model across uh, standards publications, both across standards organizations. So I mentioned the adoption model before but also within an organization. It turns out a lot of standards organizations such as ASME publish both standards and journals. And it's a lot easier if they share a common model in terms of uh, JATS for journals and STS for standards, because there's already familiarity from one in the organization. If you use the other, then everything becomes much simpler. And ultimately what all this does is lower the barrier for entering XML publication for any organization that's interested in publishing their standards with an XML workflow. So I can assure you that what ISO had to spend to get going with this workflow 10 years ago, organizations can pay a lot less than that now and get going because there's standardization around it and because vendors and tool vendors have also been able to standardize around. So just a little bit of quick history. I keep mentioning JATS. The JATS project began actually something called the NLM DTD in 2002. 
became publicly available in 2003 and just in the five years between 2003 and 2008 became so successful that the people in the community said, you know, we really need to make this a standard rather than a less formal community project. And so that was when NLM moved to NISO was in 2008. The moniker was changed from the NLM DTD to JATS, the journal article tag suite, and it became a formal NISO project. At that point, we actually stepped back and wanted to update it. And so it took four years until 2012 to actually come up with uh, the version 1.0 of JATS in 2012. That's known as anti-NISO Z39.96. JATS in turn begat ISO STS in 2011, as I mentioned earlier, and then it's the ISO STS foundation that we use to create NISO STS starting in 2015, and that actually became a standard two years later in 2017, and that's formally known as anti-NISO Z39.102. So the goals when we created the uh, working group to turn ISO STS into NISO STS were number one, to expand it for use by standards development organizations uh, and essentially think beyond the ISO and NSB case, but to think about all standards bodies. The second was to update it with a more current version of JATS. By this point, JATS had been through another uh, five years of iterations and we wanted to uh, incorporate some of the updates from JATS that were actually quite useful. The third is we wanted to add some additional structures that hadn't been needed by ISO originally, but other organizations were finding they needed, such as tables of content, contents, uh, index structures, and uh, a secondary table model. But also very importantly, this is clear right from the get-go with, um, uh, with the committee that was working on this, is we had to maintain backwards compatibility with ISO STS so that anyone who was already using ISO STS could almost seamlessly transition to NISO STS. So we put out a call for interest in August of 2015, and actually we were overwhelmed with the number of organizations and people who were interested in being involved in this project. We ended up with 43 people. We realized the only way to make it manageable was to split into two different groups, a steering committee that would uh, determine policy and a technical committee that would actually work on the technical models. These are people who are very comfortable down in the bowels of XML. Uh, both groups were co-chaired by myself and my colleague, Rob Wheeler at ASME. Um, Tommy Usden and uh, Debbie LaPere of Mulberry Technologies participated in both. Uh, Debbie LaPere as uh, the secretariat for the group, which is tremendous to have a, someone who actually takes wonderful minutes prepares great agendas, and then can turn around and take the results and turn that into not only the XML model, but documentation. You'll notice I've highlighted a few people who overlap between both the JATS working group and the STS working group. That, as I'll come back to, has proven to be incredibly valuable over the long term. So a standard was born. We had a first draft standard released in April uh, 2017. Um, quite happily on the day of an STS symposium that was held at the Library of Congress in April of that year. Uh, we were able to sort of celebrate the first draft being made publicly available. And the final voted for, uh, standard appeared in October 2017, uh, just a day before um, we had a symposium in Geneva also focused on STS. And here's the logo that we use for the standard. And it has been pretty widely adopted. This is just a partial list. Uh, I'm sure that there are many others I've forgotten. And if you would like to be on this list for a future version of this slide, please do not hesitate to let me know. But these are certainly ones that I knew just off the top of my head. And they represent international standards bodies such as ISO and IEC, national standards bodies such as BSI or Danish standards, and um, uh, standards development organizations uh, located in the US, such as ASME or American Waterworks uh, Association. So ultimately what STS provides in terms of benefits are first of all, the uh, ability to create new workflows. It can streamline your production workflows 
providing you the opportunity for greater automation, greater pre-publication content validation. There are some tools that ISO is using that are making their standards more accurate than they used to be with much less manual work because they can cross check all kinds of things that just would have been too time consuming before. Ultimately, this all reduces time to publication and the improved tools allow you also, uh, the, the improved tools create a larger market for those tools and less customization required from vendors. And therefore, as I mentioned earlier, you can get into this workflow for a lot lower cost today than you could uh, 10 years ago when ISO was for starting this up. SDS allows you to create new products. The online browsing platform is a beautiful example of how XML can be used to deliver all kinds of innovative services and features uh, to your customers. It makes it easier to co-publish standards. It makes it easier to interchange information, particularly metadata with uh, distribution partners. And it enables interstandard click-through linking, which is something that end users love because it means they don't have to go shuffling around between documents or using Google. They can just click and they can get to the target standard that they want. SDS uh, and XML behind it also benefits discovery in that end users, because they have better metadata, more consistent metadata across different publishers, uh, can find it easier to discover standards that they might not know about and find useful. Uh, because instead of having to know about a specific standard, you can, for example, uh, search for all standards about wheelchairs and then go browsing through to see what you might not already know about. Uh, this also allows for improved library management. There was a wonderful talk at the Charleston conference in 2015 that we do recommend looking at uh, in terms of what, uh, uh, how a corporate librarian, or in this case, a government librarian, views the management of standards for their users. So ultimately, how can SDS impact your business? That's up to you. It's an enabling technology. It allows you to update your workflow, create new products, uh, have a common platform for vendors and have greater interoperabil interoperability. But ultimately remember, STS doesn't drive your business decisions. Your business requirements drive your technology decisions, not vice versa. I wanna quickly point out uh, some public information about NISO STS where you can learn more. There is the website, nisosts.org, niso-sts.org. Uh, and that's where we have all of the supporting materials for the standard. So the actual STS standard is simply a PDF document, but this is the site you wanna look at if you're working with the standard because it has extremely rich detail uh, documentation about all the elements and attributes. It has best practices. This new diamond control lets you automatically expand or contract an entire entry, which is a wonderful new addition recently. There's also the STS discussion list maintained by Mulberry Technologies. And you can go to this list and sign up and see emails whenever people have questions or you can post your own questions to the list. And then there's an STS for I project which encourages best practice use of STS for interchange. Uh, and this is maintained uh, by Garrett Imsky in Germany. Uh, and this has a whole suite of tools as you can see here all open source uh, and available. And here are the links, the slides will be available. Here are the links for all of these so you don't have to go scratching anything down to find uh, where these are located. So like most standards, STS also is changing. Standards typically go out for review every few years. JATS is in a continuous update mode and so is STS. In part of that is because electronic publishing is constantly standing, constantly changing. And so standards around electronic publishing need to be kept up to date. So we are accepting comments for uh, suggestions, changes, uh, requests for new types of support, uh, new structures at this URL, which is on the NISO website. There's a formal commenting process as there should be for any standard. And what we follow is the ANSI NISO continuous maintenance process. So we formed a standing committee in early 2019. And since October 2019, we've been meeting monthly. And we expect that we'll have a draft 1.1 version sometime later this year. 
So what's coming up in NISO uh, STS 1.1? Uh, a bunch of things. First of all, uh, JAX, as I mentioned, has not stood still. Uh, version 1.3 is at ballot right now. So we're catching up with a couple of new JAX versions to bring ourselves up to date with that. And I'll mention in saying this, that the JAX, STS, and BIT standing committees all work in close alignment with each other. There is membership overlap, but we're actually very formal about if we discuss something in one group that we think may be of interest to another group, we'll actually refer that over to the other group. And all of them are actually guided by a common model called the JAX meta model, which sort of organizes conceptually how updates to the standards should be made. And it's actually a wonderful framework document because it gives us a conceptual framework uh, to work in for all three of these. More specifically, what's coming up in STS, and this is just a sampling of things. Uh, we've added a custom type attribute for cross-references. It turned out that was needed to be able to cross-reference the terms and definitions from the body of the standard. And this actually made it into uh, JATS 1.3 uh, that's currently at ballot. We've added improve, uh, improved list attributes for bulleted lists. We've added something completely new called processing meta, which actually sort of started in the JATS group, uh, got worked on there, moved to the STS group, got refined there, and then the refinements from STS actually went back to JATS. So this is where the two groups have worked in beautiful collaboration with each other. What this was designed to solve it, were some problems around DTD versioning information, but we expanded it to allow for other XML processing information. For example, you might want the name of a conversion vendor who's worked on your XML. And there are more elements coming up. The one thing that we're not quite sure of in 1.1 is we've had requests to support markup of requirements. So may, shall, must, should types of uh, statements and standards so that these can be extracted into a database. Standards Norway is already doing some experimenting with the named content element, which has been in since the original version of JATS actually, all the way through into ISO and NISO STS. Um, it may not work uh, for all of their needs and other NSBs and SDOs are discussing what their needs are both internally as well as cross organization. But the bottom line is we've had a lot of discussion about this and it turns out that so far the requirements for XML markup of requirements are still not unclear. We will be very careful with how we proceed with this. So we're not sure yet whether or not this is something that will make it into 1.1, but it is something that is under discussion. And if this is something that's important to you, please do reach out because we'd like to hear what you're doing and what your needs are. So ultimately, ISO STS has been successful for ISO and, and national standards bodies. NISO STS expands this into uh, needs for software, I'm sorry, standards development organizations. And the benefits of using a standardized model have been found across the board in terms of production efficiencies, new product opportunities, and easier interchange between development and distribution partners. And NISO STS, will continue to have a standing committee that will meet regularly to address future needs and there will be future updates to the standard. So uh, with that, thank you very much. And I look forward to answering any questions that you may have.